Squeeze in Moray King speaking on the energy machine of T. Henry, Henry Moray. And this will be the first videotaped presentation um, on that subject. He's, he's done a lot of other subjects, and just yeah, somehow never good. Good. gotten that one taped. And then we have remember to get your memberships $30 a year in the United States. Uh, you get back issues of the magazine, you get a free magazine if you join. Uh, we also have, of course, the DVD sets available. Oh, that's what I forgot to do a few minutes ago. I forgot to get the price on those. But anyway, you can get a little discount on getting a set yes. of all the DVDs of this conference. And I'd like that to happen. I'd like somebody in Tibet to get one. Okay. And I'd like somebody in the uh, Canary Islands to get one. You know, just have these archived all Got over it. the world just in case. Okay, um, okay so, pardon? Excuse me. 350? Oh, thank you. Is that a hand pair of pliers? I should really, really get around to learning how to read one of these days. Okay. We ready to roll? I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Larry Davenport. He's been around for a little while. Um, met with him down in Amarillo back in 1995, and he's a real dedicated researcher. He got into this uh, kind of an interesting way. Um, he's been working for 30 years now in the metal refining industry. He's uh, had to find out about uh, T. Townsend Brown, who lived until about 1985, and he decided uh, after Town T. Townsend Brown died, uh, a little a few years after that, he thought, you know, somebody really ought to look into this. And he looked around, didn't see somebody, so he decided to do it himself. <laughs> and he's now transitioning out of metal refinery into doing more internet marketing and research full time, which sounds like a really good way to go, because I think uh, what he's got here to show us is going to be pretty valuable, and we need to have it definitely on hand. So let's welcome Larry Davenport. Well, uh, I guess the best way to start this is to start it with how I got into all this. And, uh, actually, it started about 25 years ago. I was reading a newspaper article about Nikola Tesla and the things that he did and became very, very interested in his work. And about that same time, I'd be, uh, I'd, I kind of got it. I got interested in gravity. Well, what what is gravity? You know, uh, how does it work? Is it a pull or a push or how does it work? And uh, as a result of that, uh, I begin to kind of play around at, at looking at different ways that you might overcome gravity. As most people that when they're younger do, they you, you get you get these ideas in your head. You uh, I come from the what I call the Star Trek generation, uh, the baby, baby boomers generation, when Star Trek was on, and growing up we saw that, we saw all those uh, science fiction shows on TV like Lost in Space, and uh, uh, as I got older, uh, I really did get interested in doing some serious things with it. Uh, I tried building some inertial type mechanisms first to see how well they would work. And uh, that was where I really got started in, if you could overcome something with inertia, some uh, force, uh, then you wouldn't, by any conventional means, you'd be able to turn on your, your apparatus and be able to lift yourself up. Uh, so that's what I, where I started. And I started, the first thing I, the first power supply I got was a Tesla coil back in 19, about 78, 79. And I uh, started playing with it. Uh, and I got, I'd take it and there was this back of the book of, uh, Popular science years ago, there was a guy by the name of Ford. He had ion lifters, 
make an ion rocket. So I, that was my first interest in that. I ordered those plans, I got it, and you're supposed to rotate the wire in a coil inside a little, uh, like a jet fuselage with a large hole at the top, and at the back where it came out, it was supposed to be a small hole. This guy showed these pictures of how you could use your high, an old high voltage uh, uh, discharge from a TV set to do this. Well, I, I tried that. I turned it on, and you could feel like an ion wind effect. You could feel the wind blowing, but it never really did anything. So uh, that's kind of how I got started. So I, I hooked up my Tesla coil then and tried doing the same thing with it. And uh, this went on for a while. And as time went on, I kind of just... I put it aside and got into other interests. Well, uh, back in, uh, I always, it would always come back to me to, to keep trying this, try to make it work. I end up building one of the, there was a, the Hagen device, Glennie Hagen came out with it uh, uh, through, uh, he came out with some plans. I built that and I tried it too and uh, I'd get the effect and it act like it wanted to lift, but uh, uh, still had the same problem. It wouldn't work. So I'd heard of Townsend Brown. The first time I'd heard of Townsend Brown was when I was actually very young in school because his name uh, came up many, many times uh, throughout the, when I was growing up in elementary school. You used to hear a lot more about him when I was younger than you do now. You don't hear that much about Townsend Brown as much as you did uh, years ago, because every now and then he'd come up with something, and you'd hear you'd hear you hear about his research. But that was in the early '60s, and as time went on, you begin to hear less and less about Townsend Brown. You begin to hear just every now and then he comes, he would come up with something like he had. He was doing some research in uh, rare earths once, and. and uh, uh, the information I read on that, he was able to, uh, he's by sunlight, make it lighter. At least that's what he claimed. And in about the 70s, uh, that was about the end of his research on that. And then later, uh, when they the first one of the first ion satellites came into being. There was an article in the Amarillo Globe News where I live, and uh, they had talked to him about, uh, because they had given him, this particular author had given him credit for being like the pioneer of ion research. A lot of people give Dr. Bell, another researcher, as being the credit, but it was actually Townsend Brown, and they talked to him then, and this was in about 1980, 81, and that was the last article I ever read on Townsend Brown. I never read any more articles uh, about his work. And, uh, but that was the first, one of the first ion propelled satellites that they'd put into orbit. And since then they've had several, probably by now, more than probably around a hundred by now. Because in, in space, ion propulsion works very well. Uh, it's uh, since there's no gravity, you can get the the thrust the thrusting network in space, which is it starts off slow, and within a few days you're going 50,000 miles an hour, and then probably weeks or months you get up to using both the ion propulsion research and the gravity mass of the planets, you're able to get the the uh, system to work. But uh, this picture up here that you see right now is uh, one of Tesla's, an early article of Tesla where he talked about using uh, the propulsion system of uh, high energy to propel a balloon. And uh, I guess Tesla was probably the first person to talk about using high energy on planes and uh, blimps or dirigibles at the time for, the, for his research. Uh, he also had written an article 
long, this is before Brown was even born, that he had noticed in his laboratory the movement of uh, capacitors whenever they discharge, and he did make comment that someday that could be used as a useful mechanical energy. Uh, 1905, Townsend Brown was born. You can, where's my guy? <laughs> uh, picture of Brown. Well, anyway, uh, he was born in 1905. Townsend Brown was born in uh, his in Groundville, Ohio, is where he was born. And uh, right away, as he got older, he be, the, his mother and father began to notice that he was very uh, talented with uh, building things, mechanical and electrical. He'd take radios apart, and uh, he would. Uh, this is a picture of Townsend Brown in later years. But he'd take things apart and then uh, disassemble radios. And he got, about that same time frame, when Brown was born, after he was born, there was uh, Buck Rogers and uh, all these uh, uh, science fiction characters came along. And Brown somehow, as a child, got to believing that maybe you could take a, uh, he, got, he somehow acquired an old x-ray machine and uh, started playing with x-rays. And he began to notice a little bit of movement in the wires when he would, he'd get this machine going. And uh, supposedly there was an article in the, in the Ohio newspaper of, his, of uh, Granville that he had done this. Uh, but as he got older, in his teenage years and got older, and he finally graduated from high school, he uh, took a very strong interest in elect electronics and physics, electrophysics especially, and he uh, went from there to, uh, first he went to University of, uh, he went to Southern Cal, and he tried to interest some of the professors in what he would notice was some of these electric charges and uh, to no avail, they were not interested in it. So he eventually went back to Ohio and uh, he transferred and eventually got to Denison University where he met Dr. Paul Beefield. And Paul Beefield assigned him to a project where they would, he explained, he got in good with him, I guess, and uh, explained his, they both came up with uh, similar ideas about electricity forming a mechanical working force. So uh, Paul Beefield assigned uh, Townsend Brown to this uh, project and uh, working on these capacitors. And they came up with this, uh, eventually called the Beefield-Brown effect, where in an electromagnetic state, if you had a dielectric separation between at high voltages between the positive and the negative, you would get movement or a mechanical working force in your your system and it, it could be used as some form of useful energy. Uh, Brown was the one that was going to take this and make it his life's work. So uh, after he left the university, he went to work for, uh, at one point he went to work for the Naval Research Laboratory in the 30s, around 35, 36, early 30s. And uh, at the same time, about that same time, he had, he had come up with this, in the, in the 20s, he'd come up with this uh, capacitor discharge type uh, apparatus, which he called electrogravitics, later to change it in the name to electrokinetic energy. And uh, he, uh, in the old ver version, he had these capacitors that were rolled, and he had a negative and a positive end on it, and he called it a electrokinetic motor. And it, I don't have a copy of his 1929 patent, but this is how he did it. And he described it as a motor that could be used someday to power equipment. So uh, 
he did this, and then later he went to work for the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, and uh, he studied, uh, this was back in the late, or, or mid or late 30s, and he worked for them for about four years, and he was also assigned to study gravity research through uh, what would be like the National Geographic now. He went on uh, expeditions during that time frame later and for like two years where they went and they measured gravity. And one of the things they found out is that gravity varied. It wasn't, it wasn't stable everywhere on Earth. As you went higher, usually it was less. And in places closer to the sea level, the gravity would be, uh, seemed to be a little bit heavier. Your gravity was stronger. But this lasted about two years. The depression, the depression had come and work was getting scarce. And so he uh, eventually, but as a result of the depression, his work played out with the Naval Research Laboratory and he eventually uh, went ahead and joined the Navy to do his stint in the Navy, mainly because he had gotten married during this time frame and he, had a, and he needed some work to, uh, to pay bills like everybody else, and that's what he did. So he went in the Navy. Uh, it is known that while he was in the Navy that uh, he did do some uh, research with uh, in uh, gauzing, degaussing of mines and stuff. And apparently while he was in the service, he did uh, get some patents uh, to his name where he had, he perfected the, the art of degaussing. And as I understand today, some of those mining, mine sweeping techniques are still classified even today of Townsend Browns. Uh, he was later, uh, People tried to connect him later with the now famous Philadelphia experiment myth. We don't know if it was ever true or not, but they, many people believe that he may have worked on the antenna configurations. We know that he did do work with antennas and with radar, and at, at one point uh, even radar blocking mechanisms for the Navy while he was in the Navy. In about 1943, he suffered a nervous breakdown and had to leave the day or 40 it was actually 44 around that time frame he he did suffer a uh, nervous breakdown and had to leave the navy so he left the navy and from there he went to uh, he went back to working on his apparatus all during this time frame he's working on this electrogravitics electrokinetic energy and he's trying to come up with a theory a working theory as to how it worked, and every place that he went, and he, that he would talk about the electrokinetic energy, he'd run into, usually with a mainline physicist, he'd run into friction because what he, what he saw and what he described was not how they were taught. They were taught by conventional physics methods, and uh, so he ran into friction everywhere he went. He, he, eventually moved to Hawaii where he did some more work. He began to come out with more of the, the disque shaped uh, size. Uh, he, he decided to go with that and uh, on his electrokinetic apparatus and uh, he's, he started uh, on the front end, he started doing the, the, the curved arcuate electrode and he just came up with a little bit better. Every, every time he perfected it more and more, he began to learn more and more what it was doing. And uh, so by the 40s, after he went to Hawaii, he decided in the early 50s to go back to uh, Cleveland and with a project called uh, Winter Haven. And there was... Um, About that same time frame, there was uh, the, uh, in the 50s, the mid 50s, the military for a brief time became interested in gravity. So 
in an article of Interbasia uh, Aviation Magazine uh, and also uh, through RAND in English, RAND LTD Limited in England, there were several articles written about gravity. The, uh, they were, the article basically talked about a positive gravity and a negative gravity. How could you overcome it? There was this article talked about how you could overcome gravity either through uh, nuclear, using nuclear uh, physics by having like a, a positron and a, a negative electron. And in that time frame, they did uh, Sight Townsend Brown's Project Winter Haven in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Project Winter Haven, Townsend Brown was able to get, uh, he claimed, he first started out with slow speeds like four to five feet per second or less. And, with, and he had these three feet discs. They were very long, about this big in diameter. He had two of them hanging from a, a kind of a merry-go-round like this, except it was a, a lot bigger. I think it was more like 15 or 16 feet. And uh, he began to apply uh, dielectrics or insulators on the surface of the aircraft right in here. Or on this, this part right here, he's able to, uh, he began to experiment with, first he started out with uh, rubbers and plastics and glass, and then he went to, uh, Later on, he went to uh, like uh, real high dielectric strength uh, uh, materials like uh, barium titanate. And as he did this, he applied this, and uh, he started out at 50,000 volts initially on his machine. We don't know exactly how far up his voltages went later on, but we know that that was in the range. But what he noticed about this was as he applied the dielectric, as he got changed dielectrics, and he did, he started out with distance like the air in the beginning, but as he applied the dielectrics, the field would get better and better and better as he would, uh, as he would turn these machine on every day and he'd, he'd change the dielectrics, he'd get, he'd get fast. Finally it got, he had it up to around, people say around uh, this, uh, 15 to 16 feet per second, and then he began to get, supposedly got speeds even greater than that, and when this happened, he contacted the military, and the military, uh, for a brief period of time, uh, classified it. I don't know if it was ever classified top secret. There's a, a controversy in Nick Cook's book. He says it was never, he could never find any information in his zero point energy that it was ever classified top secret. But the military did come in and uh, come up with an interest. And uh, when he tried to explain to them what was happening with the dielectrics, the physicist of the, of the time, of the US Air Force, tried to say it was ion wind. He said, no, it's just ion wind causing this effect. Well, if it had been ion wind, it would have had, to have speeds of a tornado or a hurricane to get the speeds up to the, to the speed he was getting it to make it move. So, uh, uh, but after a year or two, he became, uh, I guess, disappointed with the, uh, the military, kind of lost interest or put it aside. And from this point on, he decided to go overseas in France and uh, he worked with a major French uh, aerospace company over there. It was uh, like the national, uh, I'd call it like a national, it'd be like NASA is now, but it, it was in France. And there he was able to take his unit and to prove that it was an ion win. And one of his tests, he put it in a, a low pressure vacuum and he was still able to get the effect which this disproved that the ion wind theory was not correct it, that there was no way it could have worked he was able to get the movement uh, 
so uh, that's how he did it. Uh, then later, after he was in France about two to three years, the government of France cut off his funding again. He, the same thing always happened to Brown. He always seemed to be it. Started doing something, and then they'd just cut the funding off from him, and he practically start all over again. Well, from about 1957 to about 1959, uh, Agnew Bonson, a very wealthy individual who had uh, the money, became interested in Townsend Brown's work. And so he had he had heard about Brown, he contacted Brown and uh, hired Brown as a consultant to build lifters for him. So uh, I've got a few of those lifters uh, pictures later on, I'll show you on them. But uh, Agnew Bonson had a brother-in-law named James Frank King, who was also, uh, he was an aerospace engineer and, he, and uh, him and Brown did the initial research. Sometimes there was a third party in there, but uh, the funding came from Agnew Bonson. And uh, they built probably several hundred different types of uh, apparatuses that uh, they tried. They tried different kinds of, they tried dome shape, they tried uh, mostly dome shape. One of the ones that they had actually spun around the fields and the, the dielectric on top. And they even did some reversal, did some reversals where they put the negative on top and the positive on bottom to see if they could generate lift. They'd spin this. And if you've seen any of the videos of, of Tom Ballone or uh, Stan Deo's uh, of Brown's uh, using, using this apparatus, when they hit, they used a, very high voltage system. And when they hit it, they, they, they pulse it with a pulse DC waveform and it would actually lift up. They'd use like counterbalances on it. And one, one picture, they've got a, a crescent wrench used for the balance and they hit it and it, and it, it goes up and it actually moves. And um, it would, they did uh, weight measurement. They found that there was a weight loss of a, in some of these uh, contraptions that they built, they, they did uh, what is known as a pigeon ballistic test, which is what the Navy accepts for uh, showing that there's a loss of weight. But they did, they built several of these and uh, initially Brown came up with uh, a patent of his own and he, he did have some, uh, he, he came up with some of his own later that he patented after he had, uh, was not under contract by Bonson. But uh, some of the ones that they did, Bonson retained the patents on and then they even experimented with AC fields. And uh, James Frank King, many of y'all have probably seen in uh, Tom Ballone's book, especially Electrogravitics too, he's got pictures of where he came up with the system uh, using this, uh, using AC to, uh, using AC waveforms, he, he tried to come up with one that would work off AC fields. But uh, in 1950, right after 1959, after Townsend Brown had uh, just finished his work with Bonson, shortly after that, uh, Agnew Bonson was killed in a plane crash. And, uh, Again, there just seemed to be no interest in the, uh, the research after that. And from that time on, he finally went to work. Uh, there's not much more said other than that he did, he did patent the stuff that he had learned by doing that research and uh, in the, all the way up to about 1965 or 66, there's patents of Browns. Uh, some of them are, are with dielectrics and uh, different configurations of the Beefield Brown effect. One of the most important patents that he had, uh, switch that again. Uh, oh, this is just showing the, the disc 
and the experiments and photographs while he was at Winter Haven. Next. Uh, this is, this was in the, this shows the, an inter, inter aviation magazine. It shows the positive and the negative field, the negative charge and a positive charge being separated from the negative uh, and how it would work as a flying disc A shaped aircraft. Next. This is an early, this is probably the, it's actually the second uh, patent of Townsend Brown's uh, showing the, uh, it shows the, he calls it a electrokinetic motor in this. And you can see in figure three there, the, they were kind of cylindrical shaped. This is an early version of Townsend Brown's uh, on how it would work. He, he did have the, on the front right here, he had a, uh, you can see how the, it was kind of almost like a T-form shape. Yeah, that helps. Okay. Oh. See that one right there? Push down on that. Yeah. Move your thumb up. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, right here. You can see it a little bit here in the, uh, you can see the difference in how he used to do this. They were cylindrical shaped originally, and then they were kind of parallel to the front, and then you had like a single discharge in back, and it would spin around. And uh, it was a very efficient working motor. He, he later said in his, one of his, well, his patents that it was like a million to one efficiency. So, uh, uh, next photo. This is, this is a uh, ion wind type, type apparatus by G.E. Hagen. I put this in here because this is what I started out on. Lifters, very similar to what Tim, I think uh, Tim has taken this uh, to a very fantastic level working with these. Uh, but this is what I built. You, what it is, you got cloth in here, you got wires going between here and I actually think this is more electrogravitic the way this works than just ion wind because you got a you got a dielectric separation you got little wooden struts on these and it's separated and uh, I think that's really what produces the effect you got a negative on the bottom and a positive on the top and you use very 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 thin wires going through the cloth to the cloth kind of to give it a little bit of lift. But these are very light aircraft. They're very, the wires on them are extremely small. Next. This is another version of G. E. Hagen's. This is just another uh, version of it. It's a six-sided craft. And it shows a little bit more detail down there. Next. This is a generator of Townsend Browns that he built in 1934. This, it's actually uh, part of the other patent, I think. It, it just shows the generator, how it was built. It's a, it's a DC uh, generator he built that put out quite a bit of uh, force that to, for his electrogravitic, electrokinetic apparatus. Next. This in here is probably his most famous uh, patent of all, 2947550, I think is the number. You can see the difference in uh, the, the geometry and the disk shape of the aircraft as it changes, as he gets in it, improve, he improves it. Uh, the well, thing that I noticed here too is right here in the, in the shape of the aircraft with his, uh, you've got, he's got a, this shape right here for cylindrical is all, also works very well. I've done uh, work with cylinders, but this shape right here is the best design for cylindrical too also as well. He's, uh, 
The way this is, you've got your negative charge here and your positive is in, on the outside. And uh, in this particular, he's got uh, struts that hold it out like that away from the, to separate the charges. And with these here, when he, I, I'm suspecting that when he did this in here, he had already covered it with uh, a strong dielectric uh, medium because these are very close together in this drawing. And uh, I think he covered it with a very strong dielectric medium and that's why he was able to run them so close. You run these, my experience with running these is uh, anything under 50,000 volts or about 50,000 volts, uh, you can use air as your dielectric and you will get movement, but then you sacrifice the air by having, uh, you start having a breakdown between the positive and the negative there, especially as the speed goes up, you, it'll, it'll start turning and then it, it starts breaking down on you. Uh, I kinda, I did this, mine's different from his a little bit. Uh, he had his uh, connectors on the top he had like a little, uh, he had two wires. One, one was a larger, he had a smaller concentric circle in the, the, for one, and then he had the, the wires for the, like the positive or the negative out further. And it would make contact from the top. What I did different on mine was, uh, instead of doing it like that, I chose to go ahead and put the, ground in the center, come through the, a PVC column, and then put the positive right here on the outside and uh, <clears throat> make contact with, by using uh, little uh, brass screws to connect for the positive. On mine I use, uh, uh, right here, the wires. I, use, uh, I choose to use enamel grade wire, magnetic grade wire. Uh, you can use insulated wire, it works pretty good. The reason I choose to use that is I could make it bend and there was enough insulation on the uh, enamel, there wouldn't be discharge from the distance because I normally keep these things here about eight inches apart on the top side of mine. Uh, next photo please. There's, you can see right here, he's got uh, a dielectric separation on the, here on the negative side, and then on the, this, he also, another thing Brown did later on was he experimented, first he started out with air, but he was able to uh, make a fuel burning uh, unit for jets that produced a large amount of DC, uh, voltage and a, a very high volume uh, DC vo volume jet motor which is believed to be used in the the stealth bomber as for charging the negative uh, disbursement on the negative side of the engine to cool the fuel you know uh, it's been mentioned here before by other researchers that the Stealth 2 bomber might be electrogravitic. Uh, I don't think they've ever released that, 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 that that's what the, how they use it, but they more than likely probably, we do know they probably use it for radar to deflection because Brown did say that the electrokinetic effect, the DC would block out radar. So it's very, we don't know how they're using it, but there's uh, speculation that they could be using the electrogravitics or not, but it's, it's more is not really known. Uh, this is three, uh, 3,022,4, I think it's 130 is the number. Yeah. Yeah, he can see it better than I can. It was February 1962, T. Townsend Brown. It's 3,022,430. Yeah. And you can see right here, he's got a car curved acute electrode here. And then on the negative end, he's... Okay, next. You got that? What you need? Ne okay, this is the jet. This is the 
electrokinetic uh, thermal generator. You could use gas. And uh, as you charge through these plates, they're separated and they build up voltage as the flame goes out. And this shows how he made them. They've got an indenture here. And uh, one side would be hooked to the, one side would be positive and one would be negative, I think. I think that's how it, how it works. To, but it would build a very large charge and high volume of charge at that. And this is the same one, same numbers as part of that same patent. Next. Here's a, this is just showing a side view of the same thing, how it would work. But uh, he also uh, built the first uh, hydrothermal dynamic magnetic engine. He's one of the first people to be uh, using fluid where you could charge it and use it for a generator. And that, that's, that's how this here could be used if you had it in an enclosed circuit using, a, I guess, a dielectric oil or a oil, a oil source circulating it. You could also build up a charge that way. Next. These are other uh, patents of his later on uh, using various I think that what this is, is, and I could be wrong on this, dielect there's dielectrics, it's uh, for the surface, kind of acting as more or less like a, it's another way of building up charge. And I'm not real sure exactly how this works. Uh, Tom Ballone could probably tell you more about how this patent works. He does show a toroidal down here uh, effect, I think this is, Probably we also did experiments with uh, lifters, kind of in a, a vertical design. Next. This is, I think this in here, he has a, a charge. He's got a charge on the bottom down here. And, Negative or positive, I think. And then the, this was like for the surface area of the, uh, using a sem like a semiconductor effect or, or even a, a strong dielectric you could put on that side of the, to, to build your charge. But if you look at this, it's very similar too to uh, the overall design of how uh, the aircraft works. You got, an, excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, 3187, I think it's 204. Is that right? Or is that 304 on the PAT number? Uh, the PAT number is 3018-394. And these are pages uh, 308 and 310 out of the same patent. The uh, previous slide uh, shows the breakdown of the umbrella and the flat disc yeah. and uh, how he ripple cut it so that he could get more effect out of the same space. Yeah, that's what it is. Next. These are just other variations uh, of charges. I don't know if this was... Uh, I think this here is a, a breakdown of like capacitors where you got plates together and, and you build up charges along the, the edges there. Because I, I can't see that real well. My eyes don't let me see that anymore. It looks like you have a generator here and you just build up a charge across these plates. Another way of building up strong capacity in this patent. And it's... What's the number on that patent? Next. This is, uh, this is one of Bonson's patents, November 1960. Uh, 
What they did here is they had uh, a motor that turned this and uh, the dielectric would spin between the, you had a toroyo up there, it spin between the fields and it, it'd turn around and around and it, the way I understand this worked, you'd have a section that was dielectric crossing over uh, and, and the opposite, opposite of the electrode and it would spin around in opposite directions from it and they tried this to, to get greater lift. So this is probably one of the first spinning effects that they did and that was at Bonson Laboratories. Uh, you'd have to really read the patent. I read this a long time ago to understand how it works. Next. These are other lifters that they tried. Uh, this is just different sources. Uh, I can't see this real good. But the charge would, you had uh, three different rings, three different charges. And uh, I don't think this in here spun. I think they actually used a, a way of charging them up to, to get the, the field spinning or kind of going around like a, like a motor effect between it and it would charge and it would, it would lift that way. You had a dielectric separation from the bottom down here on, on uh, the uh, system and you'd have uh, the charge go to the top and uh, one would be negative, one would be positive. Who knows, they may have reversed these two to make them work. Next. This is the first power supply I used whenever I, originally when I built these discs, I built, I used some real small ones. They were like, I made them out of, uh, I took a piece of aluminum and I cut them out and I made some real thin ones. The first ones I made were not dished like these uh, big ones here. You, you, I had, these have a uh, dish in the middle and I made them, that was my first unit. I made, it was a very crude device. I brought it to the Tesla Society after I got it working. Uh, the biggest problem I found when I started building the uh, apparatus was a bearing problem. The first one I built, uh, I actually used a needle, one of these old uh, heat lamp that spun around bearing and it was on a needle bearing, real, real fine needle. And when I'd turn it on, that was the best thing I found before I, I found bearings later on that were small enough to make these, where you could demonstrate the uh, electrokinetic apparatus. But uh, my first power supply did not go to 50,000 volts. It actually went to about I'm gonna guess 30 to 35,000 volts. And it did show the effect. I learned after I came to the conference and showed it later on from uh, Lavalette and Tom Vallone both, they said that I you probably ought to try dishing, putting some uh, dished, uh, the, the hump on the top there, dishing it in and seeing if it doesn't work. So the next year I came back, I built, went back home, and I found some, uh, what, what I actually, what these actually are is, they're Indian zills. My wife was, my late wife was into music, she was into playing flutes and stuff, and I was telling her, I said, man, I need something that's like that, and she said, well, I know where you can get these zills that are shaped like that, and she had bought several of them and showed me some of them, and I said, that's what I need. So she ordered me some, and I took them, and I modified them, because usually with the zeals, with the, in, in Indian music, the zeals, one's usually very heavy, one's uh, lighter than the other to get the ringing effect in them. So I took them, and I, I took them and uh, uh, machined them down to where they were real close to the same weight, and began to use them and they worked pretty well. Uh, these here originally were a lot bigger. They were about this, they were about uh, five inches in diameter and 
these last ones I made, I cut them down to the size of the other ones that I had. And, but that's what I began to use. And uh, my next unit, I, I modified it. I found some bearings. The bearings that I use in them now are they're real small. They're eight by four millimeter. They seem to work well. And then there's also some bearings that are uh, that you can get are like five sixteenths by three eighths. They work pretty good. But they're they're the the bearings in these are that are that I use are used for uh, race car wheel bearings. Real small. These remote control uh, racers that you buy. They seem to work. I, I take two of them and I stack them on top, and uh, I just set this. I made mine portable where you just take the whole top off from the, the column there and you just set it down on top and it works real well. Uh, next. That was a, that, this is my first original unit that I built and uh, you can see, like you can't see it here real good but the wires are crossed and I ended up, finally ended up just making the ground. At first I had two, uh, a piece of metal on there, but it seemed to cause too much drag on this column at the top. Uh, and uh, so I finally just used the wire itself as it crossed over here at this beam to make contact with, as, for the negative, and it just crossed over. The two positive ones would come and they'd cross underneath as this one is way underneath there where there wouldn't be any contact to these, uh, to this uh, ring here. And this is the contact ring right here. It's what I did. I used PVC support and I have a rod. The rod goes all the way down and it's connected and then, then it goes to ground. This was my first one that I built. I think I, this is the one that I gave to the Tesla Society back in 1995. Uh, I don't know where it's at now, but the old Tesla Society when it broke up, uh, this is all, but that, that, that was the one that I gave them. And you can see mine, I used uh, pieces of plastic. First I started using wood when I built my first early versions. The problem I found out with wood was when you charge it up, it, if it started arcing, it, if, if there was any moisture in this wood at all there, it would catch on fire and it'd start burning in this. They'd be going around and it looked like, looked like little fighter planes going to be smoke, be going around it. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious, but uh, what I ended up doing was changing these over to uh, plastic, some plexiglass. And what I'd do is I'd put several holes in it to adjust because I was just working with air as a dielectric then in it to move it out that way. Uh, next. This is the disc, and you can see uh, I've got some uh, over right over here. I've got these aluminum big discs. They're not; they're more like this. These were like the second ones that I had made, the the ones over here, and I used a little bit bigger piece of aluminum to machine them, and then later I went to the dish, the hump in the middle, the center being uh, exaggerated upward. Uh, anybody that knows Bernelli's principle knows it would actually get better if you charge that up. Uh, you're gonna create a little bit better lift because some when these things would spin around, I don't, I never measured it, but I, it's almost like they would lift up, try to lift up when they were running. Uh, but this is how they were constructed. Your positive uh, curved arcuate electrode was there. Then you're, I used the negative charge back there. I, I modified mine a little bit different from Brown's, but they worked. Uh, next photo, or next. Next one. This is just another version of a circuit you could build to, to make it the uh, for a small power supply. Uh, this in here was 20,000 volts, one milliamp DC output. And then you'd go through a Croft Walton ladder uh, to build up your voltage. Uh, uh, this, is just, this is using uh, 
diodes and capacitors to do your switching. Next. And then here's your, using MOSFETs here, you, you create a push and pull to using a square waveform, you uh, going back and forth on your circuit, your transformer, you come out and it's, a, it's uh, like AC and then, it, 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 then you go through a crawl fault and ladder. This just shows the uh, crawl fault and ladder. This shows the, the pulsing uh, peak of the uh, discharge of the capacitors. But you go through here and you, it just builds up. Anybody knows? Crawl Fultons were originally used before the Van de Graaff came along in your uh, high voltage research. And you've got a capacitor on each side and as you go forever two capacitors, like if you got 10,000 volts here, it takes, you build up 10,000, then you switch it and crisscross and then you get 20 out of the next two and it just, you can go up to, uh, and this unit here, that's what I use and you can go up to as high as many as 12. I've got two that are paralleled with each other and this, this in here and then I got this oil filled as, uh, with a dielectric oil to insulate it. Uh, I use a conventional transformer here on mine now. I use just a regular, uh, like a neon transformer and it gets, it's a 20,000 volts, uh, about 20 milliamps. And then I have it go through a variac uh, a five amp uh, variac when I adjust it now and then I then I go through these uh, parallel in uh, series uh, combination through 10,000 volt uh, AC capacitors before it goes into the uh, crawl fault and multiplier next This is just, this shows the cylinder shapes that I've used in the past. Uh, what I do with them is I put right there on the front end, I put, uh, I, got, I ended up using uh, some of these uh, plastic covers for a, a drink that you'd buy. They work very well for insulating the, the field so it wouldn't discharge on the front side there. So, and the good thing about the cylinders, they work very well, by the way. I could extend them out and just working with air, I would extend them out and I could adjust it in and out. And with a higher voltage, I could extend it out where it wouldn't break down as fast. But when I was doing experiments with the, the cylindrical uh, versions of uh, the B field Brown effect, I got a very, they work very well at one point and then and not with this unit here because the dielectric on this is much stronger than the one that I've got now. Of, uh, at one point in, in my research in my garage, I actually got them going close to six feet per second. And that's the fastest I've ever been able to get them to go. And I don't know if it was just atmospheric conditions were right, but uh, that's the best I've ever, the fastest I've ever been able to get them to go. Uh, next. This is a letter from Paul Avalet. Uh, I had talked to him in 95, or 90, yeah, it was 90, 94, I guess it was. 95, I guess it was. The first, uh, what do I got, 1995? See, my mind's already, it was 94 whenever I had done, I, I went to the International Tesla Society and met him there and he was working using, trying to do, he was trying to do the B-field Brown effect in dielectric oil and he didn't seem to, to have much luck. I don't know if the dielectric was too strong or what, but uh, he had the right idea in his theory. I, that, that much I will say, the way, the way he described the theory later on, uh, uh, he was on the right track and I think, uh, if it had it not been for his input on these discs and stuff, I probably would never have tried the the indentured the raised up disc. But he was the one that suggested that, and I told him what I was trying to do then. But uh, this is a letter that he sent me after I was able successful in February to get it done in '95, and in 19. Uh, 
Yeah, it was 95 later in March. I went to the, yeah, that's when uh, the letter was sent to me. But he congratulated him on, on my success uh, with getting the uh, electrokinetic apparatus working. And the first conference I went to was a new energy conference in Denver, which I don't think they have those anymore. They may, but uh, they, that was the first one I did. And uh, I take that back. Let me go back a step. That was in 96. 95, I brought the, the small unit to the Tesla Society. That was when I did the little, real small two-inch aluminum disc. And that's where I met Tom Ballone. And it, it was, maybe back, back staff a little bit. That's where they told me to go ahead and, and make the raised dish uh, on it. So I did that then and was able to get it to work. And, and, but in 96, I did a conference there. I did one, uh, I did a demonstration. And then later that night, Tom did a talk, and then we did a demonstration, and we got it to work. At that time frame, I wasn't using real high insulated wires like I've got on the front end here. This is a new, kind of a new thing. And uh, we come up with this the other day, because this, this multiplier was putting out too much voltage, and it was breaking down. And I kept wanting to coat this. I knew the dielectric needed to be stronger, and we coated it, and I'll have to credit Forrest for making a suggestion. He says, well, why don't you just use the high voltage wire in its place to, as your front electrode? And we did that this week, and, and by golly, we did that, and it started working pretty good. It's not working as good today, and I don't know why, but we had it up to about 30 RPMs when we had it in my room the other day running it. So uh, we did that. We went ahead and insulated this front end, and really what this shows is uh, that the, the, it is not an ion wind effect. That's the, probably the main reason of this conference. What we're trying to show is that when you do run it, that an ion wind, because we got these insulated where there's no leakage. And with the way we checked to see if there was leakage is we turned the lights out to see if there's any leaks and there was none. So the effect is not an ion wind effect. And uh, here shortly I'm gonna turn this on and. I'll have Forrest turn it on and run it, but not right now, but at the end of the, of the talk and uh, just, to, just to show you that it's, some of y'all that were in here earlier saw it run a little bit, but it shows that it's not an ion wind effect. Uh, next. Uh, this just shows the, the this is a drawing. I, t I actually got this from uh, T. Townsend Brown, Eat Current and voltage, and uh, it's really more proportional to a voltage rise. Uh, actually, it's more of a curve. It, 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 goes, it goes like this, and then it goes up like that as your dielectric increases. Uh, as you increase your dielectric, and so uh, your electrogravitic effect is relative to the rise of uh, voltage and not current. I've tried increasing the current, but what a lot of times happens is it'll, if you, if you over voltage it or your, your current does not affect it, it's the, actually the voltage that controls uh, when you pass it through a dielectric that this, uh, what we call gravity field or the b failed brown effect is more noticeable. Uh, this was off a disc I, used, I also tried this with a Holtz type Wimhurst generator that I bought and it works. Uh, it doesn't go as fast, but it does work. The way a Holtz type Wimhurst generator works is you, you have to electrostatically start it. It doesn't have any metal statters in it like a regular uh, Wimhurst generator. The reason for that is you have two dielectric surfaces and you're spinning it around and you use a, I found the best way to start it was to get one of these shoe shining brushes to start it. And once it starts, you get the static flow going and you get it going, uh, you'll get a lot higher voltage with it than you will a normal Wimhurst generator. Most 
of your standard type Wimhurst generators go to 75,000 volts, you can, the one I've got will go up to about 400,000 volts. Next. You can't see this real well. It didn't come out real well. I tried to draw this. Uh, I'll have to explain what's going on. It doesn't show it. Uh, what I was trying to show here, and you don't see it, uh, is uh, as it comes out, the, the negative charge comes out the back and around, and you got the positive lead on the front. Uh, what, what happens is uh, you're creating what I call electrical void. That may not be right terminology, but you're stripping away this and you're creating a void. And, in, and what's happening is uh, this energy is going to fill this void. So you're going to get a pushing effect on this side. And on the front side, you're going to have the pulling effect. Now, uh, if this is a craft, what would happen is your charge would go this way, and then you have energy coming in this way to fill the void, and it's like a fluidic action. Uh, I think the e, I call it ether or whatever it is. You create a, a fluidic action that's hydraulic in nature, and this is where Lavalette talked about the surfing wave, where you're actually like surfing on it. it uh, you this. As this closes up on the, as this field closes up, it pinches the craft like it's like putting water between your hands when you used to get in the pool and pump it, and it pumps this craft forward is what it actually does. And you got your wave, and you're riding, the, it's like riding the wave, basically, is what you're doing. And on the positive side, this, on this side, you've got a counteracting field which is like warping the field, basically, kind of, and it's rolling out this way. The fluid's rolling out this way, and on the negative, so you're using a, a positive pull action, and then on the negative side, you're using a negative uh, action that's actually pushing the craft, and I think that's why it works. You can read uh, uh, Paul Avales in his books, and also where he's talking about the stealth bomber and the brown he he explains that he doesn't show he show, he doesn't show the the force coming in this way uh, closing it up but he talks about it because he talks about the wave and how it pinches it forward uh, he and uh, Tom Valone's book Electrogravitics One he explains that because uh, he puts Paul uh, some material in there by Dr Paul Avalette. I don't know if you can see these. These is a little bit better. This is just showing the negative action going to the positive. Uh, next one. Next. Well, I think there was one. Isn't there one more there? Sorry. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Okay. What was your last slide? Okay. I have three slides on the bag. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead. This is some, I don't know who did this, but this is, uh, there was a, I think this uh, was two conferences ago, somebody had built these, and I think they demonstrated them here too, but they put plastic over it, and these were much bigger than some of the ones that I've did. Uh, I wasn't here the year they did this, but they said that they, some people said they did work, but they moved slow. Uh, next one. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, I don't know this individual, but I'm sure somebody here does know him. Y'all probably, but this is just another, he, di he did try to do Brown's, uh, copy Brown's design, probably better than I did to get it to work. But the, my understanding is it did work. Is there anybody in here that would, that probably saw this would probably know. And uh, yeah, bags, I think he was demonstrating dielectrics when he did this. I've seen this picture before, but I've, I've never, uh, I don't know this individual, but I think it was, I remember reading something about it, I think. I know in the Electric Spacecraft Journal, there was a fellow that uh, had tried this, and then later there was somebody get working on, I think their master's or doctorate, they were, 
doing Brown's work. This is just the top section of it. Looking down, he's got the plexiglass connectors there for the, and I think he's using copper tubing here. I think it's a like half inch copper tubing on this. Are you ready to turn it on? Forrest? <laughs> uh, I'm going to have him turn this on. Now, what we did this weekend was uh, you, need, you need to flip it all the way up. You, got, you don't have it up all the way. We've had trouble with it here for some reason. It's not, it's, but it is starting to work. Uh, but uh, in the room, we were able to get it to work a lot better than this. Uh, I don't know if it's something in here or what, but, uh, or maybe because I had it on a table or something. Could be, yeah. We had to kind of start it a little bit. Huh? It's starting to move. It's just moving slow. Uh, plus, we did coat it with, a, on this in here, we coated it with a, a silicone type glue. and We did total isolation on this to uh, keep from, uh, to, to get the, to keep the dielectric from, uh, we didn't want any discharge between it, but uh, we worked on getting it level. Uh, what's it showing up there? Off level. Let's see. Sometimes you can bump it to get it started, and it'll it'll start. But we did. It started on its own in my room, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> Maybe it'll start here. If not, we'll do it. We'll do it out there. We'll move it out there later if we don't get it here. So, but, uh, I have run some a lot faster than this that didn't have the dielectric shielding on this. We, we purposely did that to show that the dielectric shielding on this is what causes the effect and not the uh, not ion wind. Each, each, each time you do a lecture, you do it on different things. This time I wanted, because the voltage was higher, we wanted to isolate it and see if it, at a higher voltage, if you could get it going, if you isolated it. And that's the reason why we've got this like that with these high voltage leads insulated. Uh, Brown, I don't think ever insulated his front end like that. We're the, probably the first ones to try that. But you can see it is starting to pick up. Mm -hmm. Any questions, please hit me up. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know. Yes? I've done it with a breaker on this, and then the, the little units that I bought, the, uh, they were pulsed. They were, a, uh, they'd be, they were at 28 kilohertz. So the original ones that I had, but the bigger units, uh, other than having breakers on it, I haven't built a pulsing unit. I think Brown actually had a power supply that, that did pulse a lot greater than and it was made. I think that's why he, when you see the, when you see the, uh, in his, uh, some of his old video footage, he actually, he hits it. And even though it breaks down, it moves quite a bit. So I think I, he had some kind of, I don't know how he built this power supply. Uh, I understand it was somebody in Canada that bought it, which, and uh, I think it was a great loss that his equipment got broke up and auctioned off, but the family sold some of it, and, uh, uh, and that's what happened. But I don't know, maybe somebody in here knows who, who bought it. Do you? Who bought the unit? But I'd heard several years ago that it had gotten purchased by somebody. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. 
something Tim Ventura said. He talked about a ion wind in his lifting devices that went really, really fast. And so I started thinking about what the cross section of a typical flying saucer would look like if you had a positive charged top and a negative charged bottom. It could be a, not a gravity effect, it could be an ion wind going over the whole surface, giving a pressure drop to lift the whole unit up. I did some so this experiments get a double effect. later. I did do some experiments with uh, pulsing a, the charge across where, where I did actually cause a breakdown and, and, it, and it did move it. It didn't move it as fast. However, NASA uh, has considered in the, in, in the past building uh, pulse discharge where you actually create a breakdown where you build up your voltage and your capacitors and to move it like that extremely fast. Uh, this is the opposite effect. You build the voltage up and the die it goes through a dielectric and, and causes it to move. Anybody else? Why do yes. you say it does not have ion wind? No. If there's, if there, it, that's the reason we insulated it, was to keep from ion, the ion wind down on it. Uh, one of the controversies was that the military said back in the 50s it was an ion wind effect. Well, uh, you'd have to have hurricane speed winds to, to make it move. And in, in my earlier versions, that we didn't have the, the front electrode insulated at all. We, it was open. And you did get ion wind, but I don't think that's what caused it to move. Where is the insulation on it? Right here on the red. And then we've taped this over and glued it on these, uh, this this time. Well, Larry, thank you very much for your presentation. There was another gentleman up there. Well, we'll, we'll get some more questions out okay. in the hall.